scripture found in the book of Philippians. And before we look at it in some detail, let's pray. Heavenly Father, by your spirit I ask that you would open our minds to understand the depths of your word. Change us to be a little bit more in conformity to the mind of Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen. Now maybe a little bit of background to this, this scripture. Um, it's written to a group of people called the Philippians. Now Philippi was a place where the Apostle Paul went originally around 49 AD. So how many years after the, the uh, resurrection is that? 16. About 16 years after, right? And um, the reason he went there was because he had a vision of a guy from Macedonia saying, come over and help us. We call that the Macedonian call. And that's the first time that the Apostle Paul, as a missionary, left Asia Minor, Turkey, that region of the world, and went over into Europe proper. So this was the first introduction in 49 AD, first introduction of the Gospel of Christ in Europe. And th the first person that was convinced by Paul was a woman named, you know her name? Lydia. Lydia. And Lydia was a businesswoman. She was a seller of purple, it is said. Now, purple dye, well, there was one historian who wrote that purple dye was worth its weight in silver. She was in the fashion industry, you might say, selling this, this dye to people that manufactured clothing. Now, the, the place itself was a Roman colony. Philippi, named after Philip of Macedon, who was the father of what famous guy? Alexander. All right, Alexander the Great. Uh, Philippi was a Roman colony. Originally a Greek state, after some wars, which included one with Brutus and Cassius and, you know, that whole business, ended up being populated predominantly by Roman soldiers. Roman soldiers and their families. Um, not only that, um, there was some land reforms in Italy and a whole bunch of more, a whole bunch of other Roman soldiers came to live in Philippi. So th this was populated by, you might say, expats, right? Colonists from another place living there. And, you know, for, for goodness sake, Rome and Italy did not want these people back. They were there as an outpost, and they were to spread Roman civilization. There was no room for them back home. So they were like, you know, they had migrated, and that's where they were. Uh, in that place, because it was a, a Roman, a Roman uh, colony, the, the emperor cult was very, very strong. Now, I don't know if you remember the attitude towards the Caesar, but Caesar was Lord. He was, he was the son of God, okay? Um, you might recall that there's a passage in Corinthians where, where Paul writes, nobody can say Jesus is cursed. Um, if they have the Spirit of God. And no one can say Jesus is Lord unless they have the Spirit of God. Because if you said Jesus is Lord, what would happen to you? You're gone. Because you've got to be saying Caesar is Lord. That's the only acceptable speech. And a lot of Roman deities were followed in Philippi. Um, Apollo. Now Apollo, one of the things he greatly encouraged was sex. You know, sexual relations with all kinds of people. Um, back then, you know, we have ca these categories today of homosexuality and heterosexuality. That wasn't the way they thought back then. That, just a completely different frame of mind. Because males, men, they had, free men, 90% of the population were slaves. Free men had the right, and you might almost say the duty, to, to express themselves, and let me be polite here, to express themselves sexually to whomever they desired. Men, women, children, 
that was their right. Because this is what Apollo wanted. You see, that's the, that's the world they were in. Bacchus, everybody knows about Bacchus and the Bacchanalias, right? You learn about that in sixth grade history. But Bacchus encouraged what? Drinking and eating, carousing, that kind of thing. So all kinds of excesses in food and drink. And you know, if you lived back then, you wanted Bacchus to be happy. Why? Because Bacchus was the one who ensured fertility. Not only that you'd have children who would live, but also that your fields would grow. So, you know, a very different world than, than the way we think. You know, it's just very, very different. And the whole society was really based on exploitation, uh, on, on power. Uh, for example, Caesar's popularity was based in part on how many Gauls he had killed. It's estimated he, he slaughtered a million Gauls in all, all those Gallic wars. And, and a million Gauls were enslaved. That made Caesar wonderful. Yeah, that's just the way they thought. And, and like I said, a free Roman male had absolute right to have sex with anyone they would like. Women? Women were, now certain, a, a woman who was married and had a household enjoyed a lot of rights as in that household. But ultimately, the, the male members of the, of the household had absolute authority, ultimately. Uh, girls married around 14 years of age. And to, to a man twice their age and years, by the way. Okay? And it was expected that they would have lots of children. Because a lot of children died. And most of the time, the women Oh, they, they would die in their 30s, you know, usually in childbirth. I mean, it was just a very, very different, very, very different uh, world. And of course, for, for government to keep its population happy, well, the saying was bread and services. Make sure the people had enough to eat and make sure they're entertained. And you do that and you can keep the population in check. Now, that was the world lived in by Paul's readers. That was their society. And when he brought the gospel in there, you can, you can imagine that the gospel was calling people away from that mentality, away from that frame of mind, to think very differently about human beings, for instance. I mean, just think about what the gospel calls people to think about women. In Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, all are one in Christ. Go all the way back to Genesis. Who's made in the image of God? Male and female made in the image of God. There's no like men are up here and women are down here in the gospel. It's just not that way. So Paul's gospel called people out of that. Paul's gospel called people out of this uh, indulging their, their senses, whatever they wanted to do. It called them out of that. And when he warns his readers, he warns them about the, the, a particular group of people who most likely originally heard his gospel and began to follow it, but then turned away. And so he says, I have often told you before, now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Now think about that. What does, how do you live as an enemy of the cross of Christ? Well, what does the cross call us to be? The cross calls us to be people of faith in God. The cross calls us to be people who serve one another. The cross calls us to be people who are devoted to Christ above all things. The cross calls us to be a people who are honest in business. The cross calls us to be a people who care for, the, for those who are downtrodden, the weak. Uh, the, those in need of help. The cross calls us to all kinds of things like that. But now, Paul says, a lot of people who originally may be caught on, now they're enemies of the cross of Christ. And his attitude? He's not some judgmental Pharisee. He, he's crying about this. He's crying about this because he recognizes what's at stake. 
Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is their shame. And they set their mind, they're constantly thinking about this earth. Whatever is around them, whatever is taken in by their five senses immediately, that's all they care about now. So they're enemies. Stomach, shame, earthly things, they're just oriented towards their own earthly appetites. That's all they care about. Totally immersed, caught up with the values of their day. And you know, one of the things the Apostle Paul taught as he would go around bringing the gospel to a community and setting up little local churches, he would teach them, you watch out, bad company corrupts good morals. Watch out who you hang around with. That was one of the things that, not that you judge people, and remember Jesus would hang with sinners, right? But be very, very careful. Bad company corrupts good morals. And if you don't have your wits about you, your spiritual wits about you, and you're with people whose God is their stomach, who only think about these earthly things, you get swayed by it. That's what he's telling them, and he's warning them. And you know, quite frankly, had Rome not been what it was, and had Rome been more like, we might say, our world, because quite frankly, our society, in spite of what you might, the impression you get from the news, because all the, the, the news exists to sell you stuff, and it's not going to sell you stuff unless it has your attention, and it gets your attention by, by angering you, okay, and upsetting you. Notwithstanding that, our world is so much better than that world of 2,000 years ago. So much better. So much better for women. So much better for health. So much better for uh, people in the... the in, in their old age, so much better today than it was back then. And I, and I you know, I used to argue with people. I, I taught school for for a while, and I I used to argue with people about about this. They would say, "No, the world is just getting worse and worse and worse." It's not. If you really look at the data, if you really study the data, the world is not getting worse. It's getting better. But as good as our society is. I mean, we're warm usually, sometimes the electricity, but we can flick a switch. Imagine, you flick a switch and the light comes on. What about a world lit only by candles? Imagine that, you know, and sweating hot. And, oh, we don't want to go back to that. But even in this modern world we live in, still people live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their God is their stomach, and all they think about is our earthly things. And that's, that also goes on. Now, in contrast to that frame of mind, thinking that way, Paul says, I want you to think differently. But there is some really cool and powerful stuff here. When he says, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ who the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies, the bodies of our humiliation, so that they will be like his glorious body. And he calls on them and the scripture calling to us today, imitate him, think like that, get a hold of the way you think, change your point of view. And one of the things he says, he reminds us, our, but our citizenship, we're not citizens of Rome, he says to the Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven. Now, we need to think about this a moment, because we are so used to thinking about heaven as some far off place we go and we die. That's not the way the scriptures present, and if you really look at the big picture, you'll know this to be so. Heaven is not far, far away up there in the sky where we go and we die. Heaven is here. It's another dimension. Let me put it that way. What did Jesus teach us? How did Jesus teach us to pray? Thy will be done how? on earth as it is in heaven. 
It's, it's a reality that's all around us. You know, God is not far away, Paul wrote, or Paul taught in another place in Acts 17. He's not far away up there that you've got to look for him. He's right here. It's not a place that we simply go to when we die. It is a place contrasting with simply identifying with, let's say, American society or Roman society. In contrast to that, you identify yourself as a citizen of another place, of another realm. Your values come from another place. They don't come from this world only. Your desires come from another place. You live as a representative of heaven. You want God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. That means I want God's will to be done in me and through me, just like it is in heaven, just like it is in the other realm. Think of how Paul describes being saved over in Ephesians. He says this, <clears throat> Because of his great love for us, God is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. By grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. That's where we are, spiritually speaking. We're already there. We have people who have about one foot in the grave. We have one foot in heaven. You know, we have one foot in heaven. That's the way it is. And heaven is to be the source of the believer's values. And there's another reality to be kept in mind. You know, like, you belong here, but, you, but your values come from somewhere else. Right? Another reality is, we await a Savior from there, who's going to come over someday. Right now, he's reigning. He's seated at the right hand of God, as the scripture puts it. But he's going to come, and by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they'll be like his glorious body. Amen. See, the body in its current form can't last. It just can't. You know? A year ago, I was in the hospital. I have congestive heart failure. So I'm like, I can't hardly breathe. Right? And I'm, I'm thinking, i got to tell my wife i got to go to the hospital. But I didn't, because I'm a man, I'm stubborn. <laughs> but in the morning, I, I end up in the hospital. My ejection fraction, that's the amount your heart pumps, you know, it was way below what it was supposed to be. So, now, I'm on medicine all the time, right? And I, and I get short of breath, lots of times. It's a body of humiliation, you know? <laughs> It, it's a lowly body, you know. And who was it? Jerry, Jerry Lee. Jerry, Jerry Lee Lewis? The singer? He used to sing a song, I'll never again turn the young ladies' heads or go running off into the wind. I'm three quarters home from the start to the end. I wish I was 18 again. I don't wish I was 18 again. I want that body. The one that Jesus is going to make. You know, I want to be conformed to his likeness. And no matter how sick I get, I, I don't have to think, oh man, life is almost over. You know, the statistics when you have congestive heart failure are not that great. You know, doesn't necessarily kill you, but it can. I don't want, I don't want to just turn back the clock. I want to turn the clock ahead real, real fast. Because I want that time when Jesus is going to come and change my body to be like unto his glorious body. John put it this way. Little children, it does not yet appear what we shall be. But when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You know, for, for a lot of us, and I think back to the way I was raised, being a Christian was about all about making sure that your sins are forgiven, and so you want Christ to be your Lord and Savior. So you go to heaven when you die. There's not a whole lot in the scripture about going to heaven when you die. To be absent from the body, present with the Lord, we take great comfort from the thief on the cross, for sure. Today you'll be with me in paradise. 
But there's not a whole lot in the Bible about that, in, let's call it the intermediate state. It's all about new heaven and new earth. It's all about a reconstitution of the way the world was supposed to be originally. It's all about change, at, and I'll put it this way, at the atomic level. There's going to be an atomic change to this world. And it sounds fantastic. And you can choose to not believe it. Then, well, you choose not to believe it. But if you really look at the scriptures carefully, you can see that the goal is the transformation of all things. Creation and God's people. The ultimate goal. Revelation 21. Like the last, last book in the Bible. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them as their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For, get this, the old order of things has passed away. There's a, there's a wonderful future in store for us people. A wonderful future. Like nothing, maybe, maybe you're looking forward to going on a cruise. A cruise is nothing, nothing compared. There, there's not a joy we can experience on this earth to be compared to the glory that will be revealed to us. It's, it's, it's as, the, as the old Scott would say, beyond our kid. You know, we, we, we can't even get it. It's just so wonderful. Paul to the Corinthians wrote, If our hope in Christ is for this life alone, because sometimes people will say, that, Well, even if there is no God, in it, it just, it's still better to be a Christian. Paul writes, If our hope in Christ is for this life alone, we are to be pitied more than all people. But Christ has indeed been risen from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. His resurrection is the guarantee that we will rise. And his resurrection body is the same kind of body that we're going to have. And it's quite interesting when you start thinking about it. I mean, he would he could pass through walls and yet he could cook breakfast. You know, it, it, it's just quite amazing. As in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be, will be made alive. Each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, and then it is coming those who belong to him. And then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. You know, when I was a little kid, I remember reading this and not just did I didn't get it. Because I just wanted to go to, you know, I wanted to go to heaven when I died. That's just the way I thought. That is not that is so so short-sighted. So short-sighted. He must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Or Romans 8. I consider our present sufferings are not comparable to the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the revelation of the sons of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until the present time. Not only that, but we ourselves, who are the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we await for our adoption as sons. So as positive as we can be in, in being committed to Christ and living, living a godly life and, and serving others, there's still, you know, there's still that groaning part. There's that song, this is my father's world. Do you know that song? This is my father's world. And, and there's a line in it about, though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. There, there's a lot that's wrong. There's a lot that's wrong. But for God's sake and for your own sake and for my own sake, develop a mind, a frame of mind that is so heavenly minded that you are of complete earthly, earthly good. Uh, 
let me just close with this. The, the APA, American Psychological Association, gives a definition of mindfulness. Mindfulness is an awareness of one's internal state and surroundings. And mindfulness is employed in a lot of diff different therapies in helping us work through s struggles in life. Well, that's what Philippians 3 is all about, a different mindfulness. A mindfulness that remembers we belong, some, we belong somewhere else. We belong here, don't get me wrong, we do belong here. But our values, our worth, our goals, our objectives, all that stuff comes from the heavenly realm. On earth as it is in heaven. And as we develop this frame of mind to cultivate a mental state that is like the mind of Christ, we will be so heavenly minded that we will be of tremendous earthly good and make the best of life as it is. May God help us to think as we ought to think, to love as we ought to love. And, and when, we, when we mess up, what, what do we do? You get back up. God had messed up. That's why Jesus died. Let's bow for prayer.